Welcome to the Licensing in Games video series from Leia. Uh, my name is Mitch and today I'm very pleased to be joined, uh, honoured to be joined by our CEO and co-founder at Leia, Ratchet Motti. Ratchet, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Mitch. Um, good to be here. Hopefully uh, my appearance doesn't completely eliminate uh, the audience and um, if that happens, I won't be coming back. <laughs> so um, thanks for making time. Thanks for organising. Absolutely. Uh, and also very pleased to be joined by Tianyi Gu from uh, Newzu. Tianyi is the mobile market lead for Newzu. Uh, thanks for joining us, Tianyi. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm also very happy to be joining this uh, broadcast and, and recording and uh, to yeah talk about IP uh, games on mobile. So uh, yeah, very pleased to be here and talk about mobile games. Awesome. That's what well, I we're do. pleased to have you here as well because we're just kind of like two babbling idiots and you know everything there is to know about IP and mobile games. So you'll bring some, some much needed balance. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, Newzu is a, uh, a market analytics, a market data and, and analytics tool for, for mobile games, for, for esports, uh, gaming. And today we're actually going to be talking about very topical, a report that Tianyi was involved in, uh, which looked into IP based mobile games in 2021. So really excited to talk about that. Uh, why don't we just start with a couple of quick intros, a bit of background about yourselves if we could. Ratchet, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Look, I'll keep mine brief, um, given that it's the Leia uh, podcast. But um, yeah, Ratchet here, CEO and co-founder at Leia. I'm excited to be here. It's been a really fun, um, I guess, now kind of close to 12 to 18 months uh, building Leia and, and the, the team around it. And one of the most exciting things is seeing this IP space uh, grow and change and the, the rise of demand and the types of kind of collaborations we're seeing uh, across mobile, across different platforms as well. Um, so I won't go into my background too much apart from um, I once licensed a song into a, a video game and that's kind of how I fell into this space. Um, but, you know, really excited to be chatting today and um, thanks to Andy for, for joining. I'll, I'll hand to you for an intro. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tian Yi, and I'm the mobile uh, market lead at Newzoo. Uh, so uh, what I do is uh, actually I write uh, reports and insights about uh, the mobile games market, uh, like what Mitch just talked about, uh, the IP-based mobile game. Uh, games report uh, that we released a couple of weeks ago. And then I am also leading uh, many custom and consulting uh, work at Newzoo. I've worked with lots of uh, leading mobile companies like TikTok, Tencent, Google, and yeah, a bunch of mobile uh, game publishers and developers uh, in the world. And then, yeah, I come from China, so I do have a strong background and experience in uh, the Asian games market, uh, mobile particularly. So that also really brings me, you know, a very global vision of, of the mobile games market, uh, because we know like there are lots of innovations and, you know, developments in, in Asia, like China and Japan that are really leading uh, the development in the West uh, in mobile gaming as well. So yeah, very glad to be here. Awesome, very impressive background. And Ratchet forgot to mention that the song was into a NASCAR game. So um, feel free to roast him in the comments for that. Um, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about the report now. So um, one of the most striking insights I, I found into the report, uh, Tianyi, was actually the first one, um, which was of the top ten most downloaded new non hyper casual games. <laughs> got all of that out. Um, only one of them was not IP based, which I just like, it's crazy. I mean, it makes a lot of sense given that we're all like familiar with the licensing space, but, um, st still just thought that was crazy. So I guess I'm curious, like, how does that compare to recent years or, or previous years in terms of the number of new IP, uh, IP based games in, in mobile? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like the question a lot, actually. So I didn't really do that in the report myself. And I did, you know, some like extra analysis, uh, to look at the, the performance of like previous uh, years on iOS. Uh, so actually I want to, uh, yeah, correct the definition a little bit here because I know it's very confusing, like in, in the, in, in, in the, the analysis we do. Uh, so what we do is actually we looked at the top 100 downloaded mobile games on iOS in 
2021. And then among the top 100 downloaded uh, mobile games, we selected those non-hyper casual new mobile games that were released in the same year. So in 2021. And so in total, there were uh, like 10 games that fulfill mm-hmm. the criteria in 2021. And then among them, only one is not IP based. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in 2021, there is really, it, it does show that, you know, IP is playing a very, very important role in like user acquisition and to generate, you know, uh, organic in stores, et cetera. And then, uh, I looked at the, the ranking from uh, 2019 to 2000, uh, sorry, 2018 to 2020. So before, uh, 2021. And it's actually very interesting to see, uh, two key findings. So the first of all, it's not really that related to, uh, uh IP based mobile games, but I did notice there's actually a lot less hyper casual games in the most downloaded charts mm-hmm. in 2021 compared to previous years. Uh, so in previous years, usually they're around like 90% of the new, uh, download, the new uh, new games that are among the top 100 um, are hyper casual games. But in 2021, the ratio actually went down quite a lot. Uh, so yeah, we, yeah, we, in the report, we also mentioned about like ATT and all the privacy changes on, uh, on iOS. And I think that actually also challenged the hyper casual genre pretty much. So we are seeing like a sig- significant, like, uh, slow down in the performance of hyper casual games on iOS. Mm. Uh, so this is one very interesting finding in the analysis. And then the other one, I coming back to the IP topic, uh, there's actually also an upward trend in 2021 that IP is playing a more important role in user acquisition. And I think that's also, you know, pretty much related to what I just talked about at ATT. Uh, so like targeted ads, and mm-hmm. user acquisition have becoming more challenging on uh, iOS. Uh, so like IP is really a very powerful tool for organic in stores. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's awesome. You've, you've gone and done further research. So I love it. Amazing. Um, and, and why do you think that there's been such an increase in success for IP based games in, in recent years? Yeah. So I th- think like one thing I already mentioned, I think ATT, uh, the privacy changes on iOS and Google is also following suit, but in a, you know, a little bit milder way than, than Apple. Uh, that is really like, you know, kind of pushing developers to uh, think about alternative ways to, to, for, you know, more effective ways on mobile for uh, user acquisition and IP uh, because of, you know, its large fan base across the world, you know, naturally plays a very, uh, in fact, effective way for to, to acquire, recruit users uh, for new games. Uh, so I recently also spoke to a very uh, big uh, IP holders in the West and then entertainment IP holder. And then they are also looking at, you know, bringing their IP to the gaming platform, uh, mobile PC and console as well. And then they also confirm that they don't really worry so much about uh, user acquisition because they know naturally their games will attract a uh, lot of users. Uh, so they're more, you know, looking at other aspects of like game design, etc. So I think like, you know, all the privacy changes definitely play Play a role in boosting uh, this trend, um, and I think um, the other thing I would I, I think it's also uh, related to so uh, user acquisition, but also uh, monetization. Uh, so we also like really list out in the in the report as well. We did a uh, mini uh, consumer insights survey in the U.S., China, Japan, and, and Germany, and then we we did find that actually uh, you know IP. Uh, plays a very important role on mobile to recruit uh, big spenders. So big spenders are more likely to to download mm-hmm. and play a game that is based on their favorite IP. So like on the US side, but on the monetization side as well, like IP is driving, you know, revenues for, for mobile uh, developers. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And, yeah. I think, yeah, one, one last thing I would like to, uh, to mention a bit about IP games, uh, in general. I think because IP games actually, you know, especially, uh, franchises with like very large, uh, character universe is mm. very, you know, ideal for life service games. So I think this trend is like really mm. coming to the industry. And then because, 
you know, they have such a large uh, character pool. It's like really ideal to, for games to add uh, new content, new events, new maps, new characters, new skins. So it's just like a powerhouse for life op strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, we, if we look at like recently uh, successful life games, uh, for instance, uh, Fortnite in the West and Genshin Impact in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the East, um, both games have like around, uh, you know, 40, 60 characters after several years of development. Uh, those are all like original and requires lots of resources and, 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 and investment. But if we look at like, for instance, Marvel, Marvel has over like 2000 characters. And then like, there are also like over a hundred uh, characters in their games. So it's just like natural, you know, sources of characters and life ops uh, for games. Yeah. It's like, if you space out 2000 content integrations over like a three month period for each, like there's a lot of runway there for like really cool integrations you can do into a game. Like it's, it's not just one. Um, it's really cool how you can come back and, and multiple times. Um, yeah. yeah. Curious, like question for both of you, um, how much of, how much of the increase in interest and success in IP based games do you think has to do with ATT and IDFA and how much of it do you think has to do with just like a natural evolution in the industry where I guess like developers see what some of the bigger players are doing, like you know, Jam City and Scopely come to mind. They've had some really successful IP based games. And do you think people are just kind of catching up to that now? Yeah, I think on, on, on my end, I think um, you, there's probably part of that, which is making it more attractive. I think IP is getting more and more attractive in the world of, you know, ATT and post IDFA for sure. And I think that probably goes hand in hand with, you know, IP is something that generally the big publishers have more access to, right? And so if you look at this market right now, you know, the ones that are succeeding are the ones that are often using or have access to that IP. So I think that's definitely part of it. And it's so kind of like is kind of uh, self-fulfilling in that sense. But I think also maybe I think like what we were just talking about earlier around live service becoming so, so much of a thing and how that's changed over the last 10, 15 years, right? It's like IP makes a lot of sense in live service as well because, yeah, you can spend the hours to, to make your own characters or your integrations, but, and, and, and they, they may be really compelling as well, but, you know, the, the ones that are IP based that people already know that add a lot of value from day one and they stand out right. and help with acquisition and they, they, they mean a lot. So I think that's probably interesting. And I think that also probably, you know, I'd have to look at the, the numbers here, but that probably correlates also with the fact that audience diversity in, in, in gaming is now really large, right? Like if you step back 20 years, it was pretty kind of like, you know, for, for lack of a better word, like gamer was a type of person that, you know, people used to kind of stereotype. And now you look at mobile, it's kind of like over 50%, you know, non-male, you, you've got different lifestyles, you've got different spending habits. And so you can actually bring in, more types of IP, like you can use IP that appeals to more people. And I think that's probably also something that's really been a shift here. But Tiani, I'm, I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd add. Yeah, I, I agree with what you, what, what you said, Richard. I think, uh, yeah, I think both kind of play a role in the increase of IP games in, uh, yeah, in, in, in the industry. And uh, yeah, I think you know, it's just like a very nice powerhouse to, to attract users and, and, and monetization, uh, as well. And I think, uh, in general, I, I do think, you know, there, the, the trend will, will, will still uh, continue, but then, uh, probably, uh, you know, the amount of games launched will be, uh, will, will be slowing down because like, you know, games are really moving towards live ops and long term, uh, operations. Uh, so yeah. Cool. Um, I, I think the only other thing that I wanted to ask in, in I guess, the re in relation to this kind of in increase in interest we're seeing in IP is, um, I guess, like, what are some of the factors that make IP work better in mobile? Like, why are we seeing more of an increase in mobile um, like IP based games in mobile, as opposed to maybe in like PC or console, even though like PC and console have 
these games that have like live ops and have done really successful content integrations seems as though that licensing into mobile games makes more sense and is happening more. So I guess I'm curious, Tianyi, Ratchet, like what do you think some of the factors are that are involved in that? Jenny? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think uh, also some numbers first. Uh, uh, we, I did look at like the other 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 games, IP based games we track internally at Newsu from 2016 and 2021, and then actually among all the games we track, uh, around 70 percent are released on mobile. So mm -hmm. some are like mobile only, and some are also cross you know pc console and and, and mobile uh, so it is true that mobile is like the biggest platform for ip licensing and games and uh, i think there are uh, several reasons uh one is of course it is the largest gaming market uh, segment mm -hmm. in in the world so over 50 percent of the the revenues uh, of the global games market comes uh, from mobile and it also it is growing you know faster compared to a uh, pc and console uh, in recent years so they're just like a bigger potential for ip holders and and, and developers uh, uh from that sense and then also uh yeah from development point of view it just more cost effectively to develop a, a mobile game mm. compared to pc and console so the entry barriers are mm -hmm. like lower compared to other platforms. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, you know, that the size of the market probably is one thing there. I think there's more opportunity or more publishers that can, you know, afford to, or actually um, have the resources internally to, to look at licensing or have that ability to work with licenses. And then secondly, I, I guess there's, you know, there's maybe a, a slight difference in lift or kind of uh, resources that are behind the game. I think often in, in console and PC, you get more core games, which are generally often original IP and they're building for a different reason. And, and I don't think that's a, that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. We, we, we need those games and they're kind of target, you know, building their own audience and, and um, you know, the craft of that storytelling and that narrative as well. And so I think that maybe in some cases, there are places where IP makes less sense and those creators are, are leaning away from that. Whereas in mobile, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of opportunities that are present right now in casual games and in, in that less core uh, space where I, IP is a great way to engage, you know, fans and an audience that already exists. I wanted to dive in here. Um, the second insight in the report, um, which kind of really reinforces the idea of an IP as a tool, not just for UA, but for monetization. I think you, you speak about kind of highest spending players um, and, and that some of the highest spending players on mobile are those that are within IP based games. Uh, I think it was, I think you said three times higher, uh, maybe. Um, what did you find there? Correct me if the number's wrong, but what was the correlation or like, you know, what, what were you able to dig up there between uh, highest spending players and IP based games? Yeah, so uh, in, in the research, I, uh, yeah, I just mentioned about the, the consumer insights we did in the four countries. Uh, we did find that, you know, uh, spenders who in general spent like more than five dollars a month on mobile uh, across mobile games uh, are around three times more likely uh, to download uh, a game that is based on their favorite IPs or, you know, IP universes, uh, yeah, than low spenders or even non spenders. So it does like from a statistic point of view that we see that mobile games also like are more likely to attract uh, big spenders on mobile. Uh, so they download the games and they're also more likely to actually, uh, you know, pay for their favorite uh, IPs and characters, etc. So yeah, we find that very uh, interesting. So also from like a quantitative uh, point of view to support uh, that, you know, IP games is really like a, a direction to go to mm -hmm. on mobile if you want to uh, improve LTV. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was, was there any like uh, those kind of like high spenders who spend three times more than the average player? Um, were, were there any like other common trends in terms of like the type of IP games that like IP based games they were playing anything like that 
Uh, yeah, actually, we, we didn't really cover that uh, kind of research in the in the yeah, in question in the in the research. Uh, but in general, like big spenders are also you know more likely to yeah just in general they 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 like to play more you know hardcore or midcore mm -hmm. genres on mobile mm -hmm. uh, than like casual genres. Uh, so like I think that's also a trend uh, we've seen in the past that. Uh, a lot of these IP games are actually designed more for that kind of audiences. Mm -hmm. So they have really like high fidelity uh, mobile games and with very in-depth like game loops. And then, you know, the even like soundtrack and images, mm -hmm. like everything are very uh, well designed to fit the taste of, of, of those, right. those players. So it's almost like moving away from, you know, like a match three kind of hyper casual game where you might just like slap some IP in there to more of like this kind of immersive world, which I guess is like where we see like a lot of, um, you know, entertainment going in general, right? Yeah, indeed. And I think, you know, also kind of related to uh, like life ops, uh, that concept gives, you know, to build an IP game, of course, uh, the, it, it requires lots of investment to mm -hmm. licensing and also development, uh, promotion, etc. So I think publishers definitely want to really keep the you know lifetime of of an IP game as long as possible. So this kind of in depth game design, game loops, also create more you know opportunities to for like content injection mm -hmm. events and collaborations, etc. So I think even like some IP games, of course, they're also very successful in like less core genres, like more on the puzzle, casual genres, mm -hmm. but then the games are also like desi designed to be, you know, you know, to leave room for like live ops, even with a very like relatively simple like game mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting that you mentioned like, you know, the kind of leaning into the, the game design, you know, and often in, in mid-core or core, like, It'd be good to expand on that a little. I think the report looked at a few criteria around, uh, you know, what what types of IP based games is successful. Um, could you could you kind of ex expand that a little bit? I think it was like market, game design, and then like the business model of, of the game as well. Um, would be interesting to explore that space. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in the report itself, we we, we define like three, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, angles to look at to 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 evaluate whether an IP ga based game is successful on mobile. Uh, so the first aspect we look at is uh, market fit, and the second is a uh, game design fit, and the third is is business fit. Uh, so under market fit, it it really kind of you know asks you to look at how you know how your game fits like the 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 audience is the fans of the ip before you really get started to you know developing and and designing the game itself so like you should like the the developer should look at like whether the target audience of your game is in line with the demographics, for instance, of the, the fan base of, of the IP itself. Like, uh, they like Marvel, like we know that Marvel's audience is probably more male, uh, focused. Uh, so the games are also designed to fit that group of audiences better. Like, uh, Marvel Strike Force is like very, you know, yeah, uh, contest of champions, like fighting elements. Those are more like male focused. Uh, but then for instance, like, Disney, it's more like family and uh, female friendly. Uh, so the successful titles are also more, you know, towards the, the preferences of that uh, group of audiences. And then uh, on the market fit, uh, one should also look at like the, the, the scale of the IP. It's not only that uh, the IP is, you know, big with a large uh, content uh, uh, a character pool like Marvel, but also like how relevant is the IP to your to your target audience. Uh, like for instance, there are lots of Western IPs that are super, you know, popular in the West. But if you want to bring that IP to, for instance, Japan and China, there might be like a, an IP mismatch there. Like for instance, Cartoon Network is very popular, you know, cartoon an IP in the West, but then very few people in China know about that IP. So if you want to develop a game for the Chinese audience, uh, you know, powering by this IP probably doesn't work. And then should also look at, you know, market competition, like whether there are already a lot of, you know, 
Marvel games or Harry Potter games in this uh, uh, target market, and then maybe you should try to find a niche, you know, target or try to find a different IP to 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 target that that uh, that market. Yeah, and oh, sorry. yeah, no, go ahead, Tiani. Sorry, I cut you off there. No, 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 it's just like a lot of a lot to say. I just talked about like market fit, and if you have any questions, uh, yeah, we, we we can continue, or I could also continue talk about like. Uh, game design fit and business fit no game design fit business fit i think would be great if you could dive into those as well yeah sure as uh so game design fit it, it's really about like how you design your game like in terms of uh, game uh, mechanics loop and theme art style and like how you yeah, tune how how the game is you know de- delivered to your uh, to your target audience. That there are lots of like small elements to look at, uh, but I think all in all, the most important say, thing under a game design fit is really uh, you know the developer should understand the IP laws very very well, and you should try to develop a game that is faithful to the original IP and should be, you know, faithful to the, to the fan, fa- fan fantasy because otherwise the game will feel, you know, off to the, to the IP mm-hmm. fans. And I think like the, yeah, very good examples here could be like Niantic, uh, to, uh, yeah, ARGO games. So Pokemon Go and then the Harry Potter game. I think mm-hmm. Pokemon Go was designed to, you know, it, it really, you know, fits the target audience. And also, you know, the, the game mechanics of walking mm-hmm. around and catch Pokemon, it's really like what the original IP is all about. But when it's the, the, the same mechanics was copied to Harry Potter, there was actually like a very big IP mismatch mm-hmm. because Harry Potter is never about catch catch them all and, and collect. It's more about, you know, progression and fighting, uh, this kind of thing. So there is really a, like an IP mismatch in terms of game design uh, for the Harry Potter uh, yeah, AR game. And then the artwork of the game also didn't really fit the original IP, uh, the, the or- original Harry Potter game that well. So like like Harry Potter, the game was not uh, a success at all and I was already shut down this year, so. Mm. Yeah, because I remember like, um, I played Pokemon Go quite a bit when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, was doing my masters at uni and had a lot of time on my hands. And like, I just remember how much, like it just brought me back to my childhood and also like the way it was done in that kind of AR, they did it in that AR way. It was like, I would go to like the cemetery near my place at night and you would catch like the, you know, like the ghost Pokemon and, or you would go through like the grass, go to the water and you like, it, it all just made sense. Right. So I think that's absolutely mm-hmm. true is like, you need to make sure that you're true to like the, the lore of the IP and, and, and what it's really all about. So yeah, makes a lot of sense. And then, um, business fit, I think was the, the third sort of criteria. Yeah. yeah so, uh, on the business, we talk a lot about, you know, monetization, design, launch strategy, marketing strategy, and then community management and, you know, retention, life ops, uh, all these like things. And I think uh, what is very relevant for IP business, uh, sorry, IP games is really the, the uh, launch strategy. Because a lot of these successful IP games are launched or, you know, updated in line with the like the movie launch, for instance, or like events that are related to the original IP. So like when these two events happen at the same time, it actually creates, you know, a hype among the fans uh, to download and engage with the games as well. So I think that's like a very unique uh, strategy for IP-based games uh, Mm -hmm. when, you know, there are activities going around with the uh, original IP. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I I think you mentioned at at the start that, Marvel Strike Force was a really great example of like perfect fit. I think, you know, you, you, you articulated like the audience that's there, you know, the themes that make sense in terms of like the game design and then business as well. Um, like, could you expand, expand on that a little bit to kind of uh, let anyone know that doesn't know about Marvel Strike Force and its success? Like what's been really, um, what, what they've done there and like what's been really key for their, for their kind of success that they've built there? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, uh, so, uh, Marvel Strike Force is like a, a, a collection RPG, uh, mm-hmm. tactical RPG, uh, game, uh, developed by, uh, uh, Fox Next. Oh, what's the name? 
uh, yeah, Scofi as well. Uh, Fox, Fox next and, and, and the Scofi. And then, uh, so I think if we talk about Marvel, uh, Strike Force, uh, you know, to, uh, really tear down in the three, uh, mark, the three fits I just, uh, mentioned, market fit, game design fit, and, and the business fit. I think the most outstanding one for me is the game design fit, uh, because, <laughs> you know, yeah, Marvel is, uh, you know, uh, like, as we all know, it has like a very large, uh, character, u- uh, universe. And then the whole, you know, the, 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 the main story of, of the, the, the original IP is about, you know, fighting and then, uh, these kind of mechanics. And then the game itself actually integrates the, uh, the original mm-hmm. IP very well into the game design. Uh, so it is RPG based. Uh, meaning that fans can, you know, collect and progress their, you know, favorite characters, favorite superheroes. Uh, so it kind of, you know, you know, really attracts the fans to, to play, engage and expand on the game. And then the, this, you know, uh, combating, uh, sets is also really fits with the, the original IP very well. Mm-hmm. And then what I like, uh, the most about, uh, the, uh, the Marvel game is really the, uh, Alliance, Alliance War. So in that like game mode, you need to, you know, select a, a combination of characters to find the best combination to, you know, to combat against each other. So this really, you know, it reminds me of Avengers. For, for instance, you have like a group of superheroes and then you, you accomplish your goals uh, together. So I think this like game design, you know, is very attractive for core fans to, you know, really align the game with the original IP. Uh, so I think the game design fit really stands out here. And then, uh, market fit, uh, as well, like, as I already, uh, talked about, you know, it's very designed towards the, mm. you know, towards the male audiences. Uh, that's also in line with the fan base, like, demographically of the original IP. And then, uh, so it also really, you know, leverage the, the big, uh, IP universe, the character universe of, of the original Marvel IP, uh, very well. And there's also, you know, even game specific game original, uh, uh, car- uh, Marvel IP to, you know, build the link even stronger between the original IP and the game itself. Yeah. So it seems like the, um, the creative fit there is, is, is really important. Like it makes sense for Marvel too, right? Like you could probably do a, sorry to pick on match three games, anyone out there who makes a match three game, but you could probably do like a Marvel match three game it still makes sense. Cause there's like a lot of characters involved in that, but just like the way they've done it in that kind of squad RPG makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, so one question I wanted to ask Tianyi is, um, you know, I know we've talked about a lot about kind of like big games, big universes. Um, you know, one of the things you talk about in the report is kind of the importance of having these like big character sets. Um, we spoke about Marvel with like 2000 characters, right? But do you think mm-hmm. there, um, you know, there's, there still seems to be opportunities out there for games, creating great IP based games where you might not have huge universes. You might not have a huge budget. And a few of the examples that come to mind for me are like, I think Eastside Games does some, some great things with IP based games, like The Office, Trailer Park Boys, like the RuPaul, um, Drag Racer game. They all like, st- they all, um, stay very true to the IP. And I think they still manage to like meet all of those three key criteria without having these huge universes. So, um, is that something that you see as well? Like, do you think it's still possible to create a great game, IP based game without having this huge universe and huge budget? Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you on that point. And, you know, like the report itself looks more on the really top tier, uh, you know, franchises and IP like Marvel and this even like, you know, they're also very expensive to, to, to really license and for like, like, yeah, some second tier or like more niche uh, brands. I think there is definitely a, a, an opportunity for developers to leverage the uh, the you know the advantage of of an IP. And then so again, like I mentioned, I think the the game design is really important. And then you really need to understand your the core fans and then the you know the the IP itself very well and to find like a very good uh, combination of the original IP mm-hmm. with your game. And to really target the uh, the core fans of the of the IP. 
Yeah, because like, you know, to use the example of the Office game, you know, works really well the way it's been designed. Wouldn't work so well probably as like a squad RPG because like, you know, there's not enough like characters for Jim and Pam to go and fight, right? Like, you know, you've got this very defined universe. So I think it's like brilliant the way they've, you know, kind of starts with the creative fit and everything flows from there. Um, so yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I think yeah, also like uh, there's a more casual type of IP game, uh, Minion Rush. So mm. of course it's also very big IP, but Rush. then I think yeah, yeah, it's it's very cute game. The, the, the thing is like I think this game is also very well designed. It's actually more on the casual side, so the development cost is actually lower compared to more like you know, core games like Marvel Strike Force, for instance. Uh, but then also, like, I don't know how many minions are there in, in total, but then the game itself actually doesn't really use all of the characters. It, usually, it just features, like, yeah, some of the most outstanding or most popular ones. And then, like, a very, like, good selection of characters in the game. Um, but then the game is designed, you know, in a way that there are also room for live ops and events and new maps that are created, you know, in line with movie launches, etc. So I think that's also a very well managed and designed IP game, more on the casual side. Yeah, because it's like they're kind of indistinguishable, right? Like minions, they all, like, they're not like very unique characters. So you know, a, a, an endless runner, like a platformer makes a heap of sense because yeah. it's one guy and it's just all the different worlds. And like you said, you, there is room there for, for live ops and, and events and that type of thing as well. So a great example. One of my, one of my favorites. I just want to add in, like in terms of like thematic fit, um, I know we haven't like uh, discussed this, but i um, always a really big fan of Wiz Khalifa and his weed farm game. Like I think, like it's a strange example and thematically it's amazing, but it also, I think the actual mechanic of the game is actually really well aligned with the, the audience. So, and you know, like it wouldn't be the like, I, you know, the most common example that people come up with, but I think if you look at it in that kind of uh, game design market fit and business, I think they've really nailed something there. I haven't looked at the numbers, so I, I could be wrong, but uh, it's been going for a while. It's been live and I think that the reviews and the, the numbers do look good. So um, just wanted to throw that one in there because I think that's always a, a funny one that, that stands out. But um, Tianya, yeah, I wanted to ask, like, with, with what you've seen in the report and, like, the way that IP's changed over the last few years, really, like, where do you think this is going? Like, do you think there's any trends that you will emerge or anything that will continue the, the way it is? Like, what, what's the future look like? Yeah, I, I, I like this question. This is a very good question. So, uh, I think, uh, one thing actually I already mentioned a little bit is that I think the number of releases will probably, uh, slowing down in, in, in the coming years. So games like IP based games, I think they're more looking at life. Uh, ops and live services. Uh, so maybe we will see a slowdown in the number of IP based games releases, but they're, you know, like, uh, life, lifetime will, you know, the longevity will, will, will really increase and publishers will really look at how to, you know, improve or increase the content, uh, mm. integrations, etc. uh, over time. And I think, you know, this could also, you know, happen on PC and console as well, mm. because, you know, I think PC and console, they're also moving more towards, you know, free to play and live mm. services. So I, I think there will also be like, you know, mm. like mm. we said, like mobile is the most popular platform for IP licensing. Uh, but I think PC and console will also catch up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the future. And then the other thing, mm, I think that's also happening in the market is really transmedia. Uh, so like in the report itself, we looked more at, you know, entertainment IPs coming to gaming, coming to, uh, mobile games. But I think it is really like an integrated ecosystem now, like Netflix is developing, you know, it's like TV IP, movie IPs to games, but also the other way around. A lot of, you know, movie, uh, game IPs are going to Netflix, like League of Legends, uh, Cyberpunk, for instance. Uh, but then in the East, uh, like Japan, China, like two Eastern markets I'm, I'm, I'm relatively familiar with. This is also like a really uh, big trend happening in China and Japan. Uh, so like, for instance, in 
China, like Tencent is like creating its own original IP. But then at the beginning of the creation, Tencent is already looking at bringing this IP to mobile games, uh, mm-hmm. to TV, mm-hmm. to movie, to, you know, novels and even, you know, reality shows. So it's really like they have this transmedia, uh, concepts in mind when they create their own original IPs. And I think that is also, you know, really one of the trends we are going to see uh, in the West as well in the coming years. And yeah, one one last trend I was thinking about was actually, uh, we also talked a little bit before the podcast, I think, you know, because IP uh, game games, like IP, like licensing into like a full game development is very uh, expensive and takes a mm-hmm. long time. I do think there will be a upward, an upward trend of IP injection and the collaboration in mm-hmm. games. I think this is also what Layer is, 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 has been doing at, as, right, right, yeah, like professional at. So, uh, yeah, I would also like to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. I, I think um, I'm, I'm curious to see if that trend of both live ops and, and IP usage in general will follow over to, to console and, and PC. I mean, I think in mobile, we've, we've definitely seen it happen and, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think sometimes it takes the bigger players to kind of set some precedent or make, make it make it known. And you know, if you go back kind of 10 years ago, like every Call of Duty was a premium game, right? And, and then... Fortnite and all these other live service games came out and now you look at Warzone or anything else that's out there and, you know, they've adapted. Um, and so I, I wonder as, as as that changes, you know, it makes more sense that, you know, they'll be building more and more of these games where, you know, to, to engage users, to attract them. They'll be they'll be working with IP and in integrations, which I think, as you said, like with Tencent and how they're approaching it from a transmedia perspective, I think they'll also be more external pressure from the IP creators themselves as well to actually be in the space because they'll be seeing, you know, they're seeing what's happening in other markets, but also, you know, what's happening in mobile and, and right now. Uh, and so like, you know, if you, if you own a brand or characters, you know, how do you keep that relevant? You've got to keep that in the, in, in front of the right audiences. And, and I think, you know, console and NPC is, is part of that. And, and so is mobile. So I think, both of those forces together, I, I think we're going to see IP making its way across all of gaming more and more over the, over the, the next few years. And live integrations or, or, you know, kind of smaller injections, I guess, probably make a whole, whole lot of sense where you've got these platforms with existing players that are, you know, engaged in that in that play and, you know, tapping into that with, with um, you know, to those fans of, of existing audiences just makes a whole lot of sense there. Very well said. I, I, the only thing I would add that I'm curious about is, um, I guess, like how um, smaller developers and publishers kind of like follow the lead of, of um, you know, what some of the, the biggest studios have done so far. I'm curious to see whether we will get to a, a world where like, you know, there is a, a kind of a niche game for like all these different niche IPs. Um I think it's happening slowly and I think like there's some kind of the mid tier mm-hmm. studios that follow what the big tier, like the, the top tier studios do and kind of then sets the, the, um, the standard for the rest of the industry. And I think like, I'm just curious to see how much more accessible, um, IP gets because of some of the trends that, you know, Ratchet's spoken about where like brands, licensors, like they do want to get in front of, um, their mm-hmm. audience in any way they can. So, mm-hmm. you know, whereas like five years ago, even a few years ago, they may not have considered working with a smaller studio. Like, will they in a couple of years? Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to see, like, how the industry kind of, like, develops that muscle for doing this repeatedly as well. Um, and, like, we always need, like, original IP games. Like, I think Ratchet said, like, one of my favorite games are original IP games. But I think there's, like, a, definitely a world for more IP-based games. It just makes so much sense. Entertainment is kind of, you know... Um, it overlaps in, in so many different ways now. So, and I think you can like we're getting to that point where like I think crossovers, if they make sense, let you have both, right? Like we've we've seen um, Call of Duty is it's, its own IP, right? But they've worked with Saw, they've worked with so many other franchises, and like again, if they're thematically aligned, I think you get the benefit of each side, each audience kind of collaborating in the same spot. So. 
I think we're, we're getting to this world where, where that is, like, is, is more possible as well. I, I know it's a top tier example, but you know, even in smaller original IP, I think there's you know, the, the law, the fantasy that you've got, that you've created the narrative, but there's other IP that, that's relevant or appeals there, right? And it's like, how, how do you work with that in a way that previously wouldn't have been done? Um, so I think that's really exciting. I'm sure we could talk for hours, so um, probably probably best to, to wrap there. Um, Tianyi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, amazing to get all your insights. Um, hope to have you back on sometime when there's another report or some more um, nuggets that you can share with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, Tianyi. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thanks for watching the Licensing and Games video series. For more content like this, subscribe to our channel or check us out at layerlicensing.com.